much better. She transitioned back into her apartment last week uh, in assisted living. I'm going to go over and visit her this afternoon. Uh, my brother came from Portland last week while I was at, at the Truth Lectures. So I haven't seen her for a couple of weeks, but uh, she, I talked to her on the phone. She sounds really good. So I think she's probably stronger than she was before this last hospitalization just because of being in rehab for a month, doing things that she probably wouldn't have been able to do. So thank you for asking. Well, let's open the Bible this morning to John chapter 17 and a text that we're no doubt all familiar with. I'll say to, for just a moment while you're opening the Bible, um, this is good to be here. I, well, John knows this, but some of the rest of you may not. I watched this building come up out of the ground in 1964 or 5, 5 probably. Um, I had just gotten my driver's license is how I remember that. And, uh, I didn't know you had instrumental music here, John. <laughs> we can talk about that as a part of the lecture, all right? But uh, my grandfather, as some of you know, I'll talk a little bit about him later as we look at some of the history locally, uh, was an elder at Emerson Avenue, and a large part of the original congregation came from here. Emerson, actually two of the elders there came here and were appointed elders when it started. But they, my grandfather was kind of the, not the general contractor, but he was one of the elders that sort of oversaw what was happening here. And uh, so I was looking for any excuse to drive. And I would uh, get out of school. You know, we lived about a half a mile north of South River at Warren Central High School. Don't hold it against me. Uh, and so I'd walk over and grab a car and go pick my grandfather up. Not that he couldn't drive, but I'd come out here with him. And I remember we'd go back home after being out here a couple of hours, and he'd be on the phone with some other people. I didn't find out until my grandmother's funeral in 1993 that he was talking with some other elders from, I think maybe Southport, uh, maybe Traders Point, Brownsburg, whoever was doing church building construction at that time. There were three or four that were doing that. And they'd get on the phone and say, you know, Central Supplies got this on sale and this company's got roofing shingles on sale and you can get bathroom fixtures here and there's a good deal on that there. So I guess that's a form of church cooperation. Uh, in, in, an, in an individual sense, as, as it ought to happen. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad to be here. And I thought what I would do, Mike asked me if I'd come and talk about what's going on among institutional, non-institutional churches, what's all this conversation that's going on these days. So I'm going to start at least with, uh, as you saw, a lecture that I was invited to give at the large institutional church in Columbus, Ohio, at Fishinger and Kinney, right near the Ohio State campus. Uh, Brother Greg Tidwell preaches for that congregation. And as you probably know, Greg is the relatively new editor of the Gospel Advocate. And a couple of years ago, he started a conversation with some of us who are, quote, in I, I don't like the labels any better than some of the rest of you, but we use it for shorthand. And uh, as a result of some of those discussions that I'll describe more in detail, I was invited to come and speak uh, at this lectureship, at this large institutional church in Columbus. It's probably one of the most conservative of the institutional congregations there. Uh, many of the farther left churches, so I'm told, don't have much to do with these people, much fellowship with them. And uh, we'll explore some of the reasons for that. So I'm just going to walk through kind of what I told these institutional folks uh, at that time, just uh, back in January. Uh, and I start with John 17, in which Jesus, of course, uh, prays this, this prayer. Would somebody read for us verses 20 and 21? It's on the screen, but I think it's good for us to start here. So if somebody would do that, please. Lord's Prayer in John 17 is just as much a part of the Bible as Acts 2.38 or any other text that we like to talk about, and yet we don't emphasize that nearly as much as we do passages like Acts 2.38. Maybe there are some reasons for that that we could explore later, but we have to pay attention to everything our Lord said 
for the whole counsel of his word and we need to be attentive to make sure that we are not causing or perpetuating unnecessary division. We all understand sometimes it is necessary for brothers to separate. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But certainly, as the psalmist said, it's good for brothers to dwell together in unity. If you've ever been in a congregation that was divided or dividing or in which there was strife and enmity between brothers, you know how good that is. And sometimes it's so bad that uh, when somebody leaves, it's like uh, losing a toothache. You hate to give up the tooth, but it just feels so good after the pain stops. <laughs> Not necessarily a great analogy, but you, you get the point of it. So it's good for us to be together. I would love to stand before you this morning and say that the Lord's prayer has been answered. And that believers are one, not only on these issues, but others, but of course, honesty and candor compel me to say, as you know, that that's not the case. And indeed, if we read other parts of the New Testament, we find that uh, there are other passages which address this idea of division. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter and verse 18 says there must be there. I hear that there are divisions among you and I partly believe it. There must be heresies, divisions, uh, as a common translation has it. Uh, that's just something that happens when the word is preached. And Jesus, our Lord, told us that that would be the case. John, the apostle of love, as many people style him in 1 John chapter 2, talks about those who went out from us. If you study the pronouns in 1 John, you know that the us here is not just believers generally, as the text is sometimes applied, but the apostolic uh, corpus, the individuals, what our hands handle, what we saw, what we heard concerning the word of life, all the way back to 1 John 1. So John is saying there were some who left the apostolic message and they went elsewhere. And there, there are some good things about that because it shows at least one good thing that can happen, a silver lining in this cloud, is it shows who is willing to stand for what the Lord teaches. Uh, my dad took me to a session, at least one session, I'm told, of the first published debate on these institutional issues. That would be the Toddy Holt debate that occurred right here in Indianapolis, 1954, where the Charles Holt came up from Franklin, Tennessee, he was preaching for the church where my wife was actually attending at that time, and came up. And my dad took me to that session, to one session. I was five years old. I insist that that constitutes cruel and unusual punishment for a five-year-old. I don't know what I did to deserve that, but, but I was there. My dad, I don't remember anything about it, uh, but my dad said, um, you know, if you go, he was a young man, 30, he would have been 30, 32 at the time. And he told me later, you, you know, you listen to these guys, and one guy get up, and he'd make a speech, and you'd think, well, you know, that sounds reasonable. And the next guy get up, and well, yeah, he made some good points. But he said over the course of the week, it became pretty clear who was actually looking for a biblical position and who was just making arguments. And I think that that's true. When we come to division, it can become relatively clear and plain who is wanting to do the Lord's will and who's just trying to establish a position or maintain a tradition or some other kind of a motive. So I came over to this Ohio winter lectureship and uh, as a result of Greg uh, Tittle inviting me, Greg and I knew each other. We were both grad students at Vanderbilt back in 19, and none of your business, uh, <laughs> many moons ago. And uh, he has become the editor of The Advocate. I did a little bit of the history quickly here and future events even. Uh, last May, uh, Greg invited a bunch of us to come to Nashville to the Gospel Advocate office and to meet with himself and the new owner of the advocate who is randy duke who is an elder at the mount julia church in nashville church that has 1200 members has expanded greatly they've gone to two services i think largely because of an influx of people from other nashville churches that have gone so far off the deep end that a number of the people in those congregations just finally had it up to their eyeballs and said that's enough um, the guy who was the, until recently the preacher there has just been appointed president at Freed Hardeman College. It's a fairly conservative institutional church that Randy is a, uh, an elder at. And Randy was also on this uh, Ohio Winter Lectureship. We had an open forum with him and myself and a couple of other uh, fellows. The guy that preaches in uh, 
Wasilla, Alaska, and some other folks. But anyway, um, so we came to Nashville in May of last year. Uh, Randy Duke, uh, Greg Tidwell, the guy that uh, is head of Lads to Leaders, uh, this program that's run out of Faulkner University for, for young men. Uh, Clyde Woods from Freed Hardeman, another Freed Hardeman faculty member. Uh, I don't remember who all was in, but uh, the other, uh, the, Greg had asked me to come, but Greg's also friends with, um, oh, <laughs> I forget his name. The guy's a deacon at, uh, at Brentwood. I'll, it'll come to me by tomorrow. But anyway, they went to high school together, and then after uh, the other guy went to, <laughs> after he went to, uh, I'm embarrassed, I can't think of his name. I've known him for years. Um, he came back from Florida College and finished at Lipscomb, and so they've, they've been fast friends for a long time, uh, Tim Thiene. So think about Mark Mayberry's brother-in-law. And so Mark was invited to come. Tim came, uh, Barry Kirchival, who's preaching or was preaching at that time at Brentwood. I'm not sure if he's still there or not. Uh, Jim Deason came, uh, I've forgotten who, but there were seven of us, that Dan King, uh, who's actually written some articles that have been published in The Advocate at least one of them at Greg's invitation. So Greg and the advocate people are, are opening up to seek uh, dialogue and conversation with non-institutional people. And as a result of that, they, you get this uh, Ohio Winter Lectures. I'd already been asked to speak at Harding, largely because of the hymnal that I was uh, a co-editor of that uh, the foundation has published uh, through publications. And uh, so I went there and were able to talk. In fact, I've been talking with these guys for a, a while now. They have asked me to come on some of their uh, restoration study tours uh, on a bus that they load up with 50 people and we, I join them at Nashville and we go from Nashville up to Bethany and back again, hit all the Kentucky sites connected to restoration history. The last bus tour that I had included um, the uh, uh, Bruce McClarty, who's the new president at Harding, relatively new couple of years and his wife were on uh, Dan Williams who's the head of their Bible department was on the tour and we talked a lot about all of these different kinds of issues and what's the future of colleges and how did we get where we are and just I sit at the front of the bus they give me an open microphone I've got a captive audience at least till they throw me off the bus um, so that's kind of how the Harding thing came about Faulkner has asked me to come a couple of times. Usually, they'll ask me to come on these safe topics, like will you come and talk about the hymn? But I always, I, I'm, I'll, I start by saying, look, you know, full disclosure, I'm an anti. You probably disagree with me on some things. Here are a few things that we would disagree on. They asked me to come at Faulkner this time and talk about Benjamin Franklin, the, the Indiana preacher, a restoration preacher. And, that gave me an open door to talk about a lot of things. And the, the lectureship director got up after mine and refuted a couple or commented on a couple of things that I said that he didn't care for. But anyway, the, my point is there's, a, there's the beginnings of some fairly open uh, dialogue uh, at the, the, the behest of the fellows and, and the institutional camp. This is not something that was initiated or started by people uh, who, were, who were on, who agree with me. Um, this summer, I'm supposed to go to Abilene Christian and speak at the National, uh, the, what they call it, the Texas, Texas Normal Singing School it is. I've always wanted to go and see what they do. Usually, I'll go to Wilburton or the hymn writer's class in, at the University of Missouri. Uh, but I'm going this year, and they've asked me to speak six times. Uh, one session on worship generally. One session is devoted to um, what are in, who are the non-institutional people? What the guy that's organizing this said is, we don't know who you are and we want to know more about you. A third session on what's happening in terms of hymnody among non-institutional churches. Another session specifically on psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which is the, the hymnal that I referred to earlier. And then we're going to have a Q&A session after all of that. So, but the other thing that's going to happen in the in the sort of immediate future in October. Uh, Jim Deason organizes what he calls these uh, Exploring Current Issues conferences. Uh, in 2012, he did one that produced the, this book, The Simple Pattern. Anybody seen this, have this, know about it? Uh, this was, I, I did the historical part of it. Dan King spoke, Bill Hall, Paul Earnhardt, L.A. Stouffer, Carol Sutton, 
and uh, we turned in manuscripts, and uh, so you have a book there. But uh, he's going to do something like this again this year, and uh, has invited it to be more like the, uh, I guess you'd say the Dallas meeting or Nashville meeting or even the, the Arlington meeting. I didn't know how many would be young or older here, but I thought we might have some young fellows that might never have seen even the Arlington meeting book or know what that is. Uh, I presume all you guys know what it is or have it or at least have seen a copy anyway. Um, we're going to talk about all of these same kinds of issues on a similar format. So you can see the topics there. Uh, Roy Moyer is going to, opposite Bill Sanders, talk to, and I don't know how opposite they'll be. I'm sure they'll differ a few things. If you've ever read much of Bill Sanders' stuff, he's pretty conservative on most of the things that he'll talk about. Buddy Payne and Randy Duke, the uh, owner of the Gospel Advocate, are going to present alternate positions on the question of church government. Uh, Donnie Rader, I don't know who Chad Ramsey is. Anybody know? Know some of these folks? Uh, Alan Dvorak, Donnie DeBoard, I know he preaches in Southern Tennessee. I think I told them all. But these are all guys that uh, on the institutional side that are pretty conservative. Uh, they're part of this gospel advocate corpus or orbit, however you want to describe it. So in terms of what's going on in, as far as the discussion is concerned, that's that part of it now. I want to come back and go deeper into history for a few minutes. Uh, anybody have questions so far? We may come back to some of this, but anybody wants to ask about any of the current kinds of goings on, this would be a time to do that. Or we can save it till later. Yes. It, it's it's like the Arlington meeting. It's an invitation only. But Jim does this, and not just this year, but every year. It's a, at a, a conference center that has room for 50 people. So he's asking 25, and uh, Greg is asking 25. And uh, if you didn't get an invitation, you probably he'll have his strong arm guards turn you away at the door. I'm guessing. <laughs> um, I, I took a different approach when I did the organize the Nashville. Uh, Dallas meetings and have just said who, whosoever will may come because Arlington had a lot of bad press at the very beginning. Some of you who were alive then may recall that individuals said, well, you're trying to run the brotherhood. You've got this secret meeting. You're going to make all these decisions and so forth, which I think was silly. But uh, even when we did the Nashville meeting, I had some of my, one of my good friends said, are you trying to sell the farm? And I said, I, I don't, you know who got the deed? <laughs> I don't, I don't have the deed. I couldn't sell it even if I wanted to, but uh, some of my friends thought I'd been out in the sun too long uh, when I did that. So no, it's, it's, it's closed, I guess. And that's, although th there'll be a book that's produced. I mean, we're, we're in the process of getting our manuscripts turned in by July 15th. So um, we'll, we'll be able to read whatever's said and it may be recorded. I don't know. I don't handle those details. But you'll probably recall, going back to Judges 2, you, you get this generational change that I see as a key to division. Uh, and I think you, I mean, I just see this the more I look at church history and various divisions. I mean, it's just as plain as day, as far as I can tell. Joshua dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went to his inheritance, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. And then you get that next generation for whom Joshua might just as well have been Moses or Abraham. I mean, he's just a name on a piece of paper on a scroll somewhere. They didn't know him. They've heard about him, but they didn't personally have that experience. And they did not have the experience of being in even that second generation that that experienced what happened after they they came into the land and you know the, the text as well as I do uh, about what happens with regard to that there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel they would heard about it but they don't really they haven't experienced that and so they provoked the Lord to anger we're told because they began to do the things that their fathers and their grandfathers would not do took the Lord and served all these Baal gods, and so the hand of the Lord was against them. And I see that sort of second, third generation thing as being critical to that. So the Lord raised up judges, and 
you know the story as it cycles through the whole book. But yeah, they come back to the Lord for a period of time, and then this generational thing starts all over again. So if you look at that in terms of how that applies to, quote, restoration history, and I'll define that in a moment, but you, in the 1830s, you get this widespread division from the Baptists. I mean, it's not just, we're not talking here about local squabbles over you know, carpet or put a steeple on or what, how are you going to have Bible class or whatever the, you know, are you going to chink the logs in your meeting house in the 1830s. Uh, this is a widespread division that, that affected nearly every Baptist association, every Baptist church, as the Campbellites are either leaving or being kicked out. Uh, and it, it just decimated a lot of these um, Baptist associations. I mean, the Green River Association in uh, central Kentucky lost more than half of their churches. Um, Philip Fall, when he moved to Nashville, takes the entire First Baptist Church of Nashville out of the Concord Association, with the exception of five members. Uh, he previously had kept the minutes of the Long Run Association of Churches of Christ. That's the Louisville area of the well, Baptist churches. Still, the Baptist Association in Louisville today goes all the way out to Shelby County and Bullitt County. But he, when he was elected secretary, he kept those minutes as the minutes of the Long Run Association of Churches of Christ. So you get this widespread division. You get all of the the Beaver Baptist Anathemas, adopted by the Beaver Baptist Association of Pennsylvania, uh, excoriating the Campbellites and talking about how bad they are and what they do. So it's a widespread kind of division over, you know, what are we Baptist or are we Christians? Pretty fundamental kind of an issue. Well, again, some of the other issues were uh, what's the role of a local church as opposed to a hierarchy of local churches sending money and representatives to an association, which then sends money and representatives to a state association, which then sends money and appropriations and messengers or electors to the national association and so forth. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that were splitting Baptist churches in every hamlet and city and a uh, Baptist association across the land. Uh, are we going to be local churches or are we going to have human agencies? That hierarchy system gets replayed, that's what the Missionary Society was. The Missionary Society the diagram, it looks exactly like a Baptist Association. Just peel the labels off the Baptist Associations and plug in Missionary Society, you've got exactly the same kind of diagram. So are we gonna use human agencies to spread the gospel? Are we gonna use Missionary Society? What, what's the deal here? Those were the kinds of issues. In the 1890s, so we're talking 60 years later, roughly, uh, we're into this third generation. We're not on the frontier anymore. America has survived the Civil War. We're into the Industrial Revolution. Uh, America is churning out all kinds of goods. It has become an international industrial power. And that change in culture and society of industrialization and urbanization and then all the immigration that was happening, the three big themes we talk about when we're teaching American history, um, that changed the very face of America. Uh, and so you've got among churches now this widespread division over worship. Are we going to use instrumental music or not? Uh, over the kind of service we do, are we going to use human societies? Again, missionary societies, very much like the Baptist Association, human societies and so forth. Are we going to have women preachers? I didn't put that up there, but that was another huge issue. Um, if I forget to quote it, I'll just go ahead and do it now. There was a kind of a bellwether article that I've cited in a lot of things. It's in, in my speech in the simple pattern, I think, but an article, this is about 1896 in the Gospel Advocate, in an article entitled, No Man Wishes Women to Keep Silence in the Churches. And in order to, to prosecute that end, the guy says uh, something, he has a pretty close quote, um, we cast aside apostolic examples when we want to if we like them, we follow them. If we don't like them, we don't. And he's pretty open about saying we kind of pick and choose what we do in order to get where we want to get to. Uh, well, in the 1950s, another three generations, roughly speaking, are we going to have just local churches again? Are we going to use all these parachurch agencies like the Herald of Truth or whatever else it might be uh, in evangelism? Are we going to support caregiving institutions, homes for the aged, uh, orphanages? So, forth. so those kinds of things are, are issues that divide congregations 
primarily because they demand fellowship or joint participation. Uh, if you roll an instrument into a congregation, or you decide you're going to use the collective monies of the church, the treasury, and I know some people don't like that word. If you've got a better word for it, I'm all ears, but I'm going to use that word for now. You're going to use that to support I don't know, the cross, the, some college somewhere, what an orphanage. You've got really three or four unenviable choices. You can either leave because that violates your conscience. You, the instrument, you, you can't you think it's unscriptural to sing, so you can't sing. Or you can sing and violate your conscience. Or you can kick up enough sand and make enough of an objection that the church divides and other people leave. Or you can leave. I mean, the, none of those are really good choices. But those are the choices that you face when somebody introduces something that involves cooperative activity. That somebody either must do this in the worship or as they drop their contribution in the plate or else they have to refrain from doing something that they uh, believe is scriptural. So you get this process of division in which issues arise, whatever the issues may be. And sometimes I almost think that I don't want to say that the issue doesn't matter because issues matter, but it's almost like this division was going to happen and it didn't really matter what the issue was. Somebody would find an issue uh, to, to divide over or there would be something that would arise just from the nature of this is the direction the brethren want to go and they're willing to do anything to get in that direction. It doesn't matter. So there, there are always doctrinal undercurrents to these divisions. I, I think there are tremendous social and economic foundations that I won't go into here, but we can talk about that later if you want. Generally, there's usually an exodus of about 10 to 15 percent of the members of churches or the number of churches. Uh, you can document this in the 1890s division with all the census statistics that the government gathered. They sent people around to gather census figures for religious bodies. You couldn't do that today. People would scream about it being unconstitutional, but in 1906 and 16 and 1926 and 36, the government paid for these censuses to be gathered to try to get as accurate uh, information as possible on how many churches, how many members, how much did you pay for your church building, how much do you pay your preacher, all these things. These would be considered invasive questions today. And so after World War II, you don't get any more uh, uh, religious censuses. But what they reveal is that generally speaking, about 10 to 15 percent of the, the churches and members are shed off, usually kicked out because they're in the minority. As I once put it, they're kind of told, uh, like an older brother telling his younger sibling, go play in the traffic. I don't really care what happens to you while you're playing in the traffic. You can get out of here. But then what happens is that this 85 to 90 percent majority starts to shrink over time because there are a lot of reasons for this. They're, they're not very evangelistic, ultimately. The, the, the idea is everybody should worship the church of your choice. We're all in this together. We've got this more ecumenical, more accepting kind of an idea. Then you lose your evangelistic edge. If you think the other guy is okay in the denomination where he is, what's the reason to try to evangelize him or, or cause him to see the error of his way and even trying to convert non-Christians to just a loss of evangelistic fervor in many instances. Um, and then you get what's going on among the institutional people, which people would just, you know, they vote with their feet. They leave and they go elsewhere. Um, I'll give you an example of this where I live, the, the Naperville Church of Christ. Naperville is the fifth largest city uh, in Illinois, so after Chicago and Joliet and Rockford, Aurora, I guess. Uh, it's right next to Downers Grove. I live nearby. In fact, I used to drive right past the Naperville. It's probably the biggest institutional church in the area, uh, very much in the Pepperdine orbit. They have taken baptism down off their website as a, as a point of doctrine that they would insist on. And as a result, we get all kinds of people who are coming to over the years to Downers Grove because they go there and they just go, uh, not for me, and then when they move to the area, and then their parents come to visit them, and they come, and they, they go, they, oh boy, are we really glad they found you. Yeah, we know you're an anti-church, but man, is a lot better than the puppet show that we were getting over, and it's like four miles away from the Downers Grove building. Well, uh, I had lunch when I moved up there with the young preacher who has since gone to Pepperdine as campus minister, and then has left them and gone, I don't know where he was going. Anyway, 
But I asked him, I said, what's the difference? What, what would be the drawing card for somebody who moves to Naperville or anywhere in the western suburbs of Chicago and wants to go to church here? What's the advantage to them over going to the Living Waters Evangelical Free Church that's a quarter mile down the road on the main intersection of your street? Where they have a bigger building, a bigger gym, better family life center, better ministries, and all of the things that they do, way better instrumental music because they've been doing it a lot longer than you guys have been doing it. So what's the drawing card to come to the Naperville Church of Christ as opposed to, and I'm not picking on them, it's just an example, as opposed to going to one of these evangelical denominations? And the answer was, not only his, but one of the elders sitting at the same table having lunch, well, it's just, it, it's our tradition, and somebody who comes from the Church of Christ tradition might feel more comfortable. And I'm like, dudes, <laughs> tradition is the worst possible argument I can think of to, to perpetrate a division or to have it. I mean, why not just throw your lot in with these guys? If that's the best thing you can say about it, it's just that we're, we're kind of keeping up something that's traditional in some ways. And I, I don't know much that they do that's traditional than most churches of Christ. They look like, they, truth to be told, they want to be like the evangelical free church down the street or some other evangelical mega church. Uh, this guy had gone to Trinity to get his, his doctorate and was teaching at, at Wheaton College. I mean, their whole milieu is we want to be like the denomination down the street. It just we, we know they kind of do these things they wouldn't admit that but they do them better than we do so anyway that's where you get this shrinking of the majority for for those and maybe some other reasons and I, maybe I'm reading a little bit of somebody's motives here but I you know you, you get around this stuff and sometimes you, you can just get a whiff of it I, my experience with some of this goes back to my days as a student at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville where I was taught in church administration courses how to build a big Baptist mega church and you just kind of develop a sixth century. Well, what happens though is that you get this kind of what I sometimes have called a, a second exodus. People that get tired of the direction that these churches are going. And so they leave them and come, like I just described, to a more conservative group. But they bring baggage with them. They, they say, you know, we haven't heard preaching like this in a long time. I don't agree with everything you do. I don't think it's wrong to have an orphanage. I don't think it's wrong to have a kitchen. But, but we'll come here and worship and not make an issue out of that just because uh, we like it better than the coffee bar that they have over there or whatever else they're doing. Well, that kind of baggage then kind of seeps into churches, and, and uh, it can have an impact on that. Now, there, there eventually gets to be kind of rough numerical parity. If you look at the, inst the uh, instrumental music division of the 1890s, when the disciples of Christ, the Christian churches actually collectively, both versions of them, they were together at that time, when they left and went out, to, out in left field, they left behind about 10 or 15 percent of those who had been in those congregations but who opposed to the instruments, wouldn't go along with the missionary society. That 85 percent over the next 20 or 30 years uh, begins to divide over similar kinds of issues. And in 1927, you get the formation of the North American Christian Convention, the conservative Christian churches. And if you talk to these guys, you know that's a critical uh, differential as far as they're concerned. If you're talking to a, a conservative Christian church guy who's in the NACC and you refer to them as the disciples, they're going to, A, think you don't know what you're talking about, and B, they're going to be real allergic to that because they want you to know they are not of the disciples. And so when they divided in 1927 and the disciples go through this restructure over the next 40 years, and in 1968, they declare themselves a denomination. They quit. They say, we need to quit saying we're non-denominational because we're not non-denominational. We look like a denomination. We talk like a denomination. We walk like a denomination. We quack like a denomination. And so let's quit saying we're non-denominational and say we're a denomination. And we want to be a denomination. We want to be like the other denominations. And we want to enter into the ecumenical movement and the consultation on church union. Well, there's a large chunk of churches that didn't go along with that. And so they formed this North American Christian Convention, uh, mostly headquartered around Cincinnati. That's where the NACC is. Cincinnati Christian Seminary is there and the college that's the undergraduate program for that. Most of the disciples institutions, you're probably aware, are here in Indianapolis. 
uh, many of their mission agencies and their retirement funds and their pension board and all the denominational uh, groupings, their flagship seminary, which is Christian Theological Seminary, is still here. And so that stage sets up for the next division. You get a lot of influx of people who are fleeing the ultra-liberalism that has finally eaten a hole into this. And so by the 1960s, these three groups that started with an 85-15 split are now pretty equal. They equalize at about a million people each with churches of Christ growing from 100,000 to a million by the 1950s, let's say. The disciples have shrunk down to about the same size. And of course, the disciples continue to bleed members even today. And you had that middle group, the North American Christian Convention. So this process of division occurs generally about every three generations. And uh, there's, there is this, this process to it. So I kind of walked through some of that already. Um, the, the other key thing is, though, that by the time you get to the third generation, um, living memory is generally erased. There are not many people alive who have an adult memory of the past major division and how ugly that is. Uh, I'm at an age where I can remember 1958 as a 10-year-old, I can remember my dad, who was treasurer at the Irving E. Church, probably the largest Church of Christ north of the Ohio River at that time, possible exception of Thayer Street in Akron. Uh, it's where Earl West had preached. It's where Cecil, Mike's brother, had preached before that. They got a guy in who was promoting the orphanage for the first They hadn't been supporting an orphanage. My granddad was an elder there. He left and went to Emerson Avenue, but my dad was ultimately told, you either write a check to Schultz Lewis Orphanage, and he said, I can't do that in good conscience, or the alternative is you turn in the checkbook and go somewhere else if you can't get with the program. Now, that does not give a young man a lot of room to maneuver. And so I have a childhood memory of my dad with my mom holding his hand, emotionally reading his letter of resignation over the telephone in our kitchen. I'm probably reading it to my granddad just to see what he thought of it and needed to change. But I had to wonder, why, you know, why do I have to leave all of my Sunday school buds at Irvington and drive halfway across the city of Indianapolis to a strange church that I don't know anything about at Emerson Avenue? And, uh, you know, why, why is that? But anybody who's younger than me has no memory of that. So as those of us who are older over the next 10 years or 15 or however long, as we get planted in the ground, we're going to have a whole group of people who have bobbed to positions of decision-making capability in congregations as elders or, in the case of the two-thirds of churches that don't have elders, as the deacons or people who have the authority to make decisions about certain things. And I have no memory of either what the issues were or why that division occurred or how nasty and ugly it can that they don't know anything about fist fights in the lobbies or lawsuits over church property or any of the other nasty business that went on, sometimes on both sides of the question. That's just not a part of the living memory. And any of us who have even childhood memories of that, are just got to have this in the back of your mind. This just, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. The, the price is just too high in addition to all that. Well, a little bit of family history that, that incorporates this. This is the messenger in 1932, 49th Street Christian Church, for which James Wolfgang, that's James Otto, my grandfather, was the financial secretary. His brother-in-law, Paul Webster, was the official board chairman. Anybody know what 49th Street Christian became? Well, it's what's now known as E91. Anybody know what E91 is? If you Google E91, you will find out that it is the logo for the East 91st Street Christian Church in Indianapolis, which is a large mega church in the North American Christian Convention. We'll talk more about that later. My granddad was uh, raised in the Christian church, but he was always a Bible student, a collector of Bibles. It's an article in the Indianapolis News, which was the old... Afternoon newspaper. Some of you can remember, Indy used to have two newspapers, the Star in the morning and the News in the afternoon. But 
Yes, sir. Had the Times. That's correct. Yes. My brother delivered the Times. I delivered the Star in the morning and the news in the afternoon. Yeah, but that's absolutely right, Steve. Um, and uh, they did an article about my grandfather. He had come into from his brother an old uh, 1599 Geneva Bible, which now went to my dad first and then to me. Uh, this church growth process goes from a little clapboard building on 49th Street um, with uh, it, uh, another thing I thought was interesting about that. How do I, how do I go back? Here we go. They had an ad in the church bulletin for my grandfather's service station, the 52nd Tea Station. Wolfgang Super Service, which uh, was, went bit the dust like a lot of other businesses in the Depression about a year, I think in 1933, and so he went to work for Honeywell. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that here's this church that was fairly conservative, and the guy who was preaching there, O.A. Trinkle, was just death on the disciples. He was determined that this Christian church would never join the disciple movement and was pretty active. This is only five years after the North American Christian Convention started. He was very active in that. So I'm just saying here, you get these divisions uh, that, that separate out kind of into three separate movements. Well, what happened with uh, E91 is it became this huge mega church. But my granddad, who moved off the farm in 1919 after he got out of the U.S. Navy following World War I, um, moved here to Indianapolis, and on the radio in the late 20s, he heard E.G. Creasy. Steve, you remember Brother Creasy? Horse Cave, Kentucky. Rode the rails up to Indianapolis, bought airtime. They met in the Red Man's Hall on East uh, New York Street, about 4,500 East New York. And my granddad heard Creasy preach, and he said, Mom, we have not heard that kind of preaching since we left the farm. We're going to go hear this guy. I mean, they were used to hearing in the old Christian church up at Sheridan, Indiana, about 226th Street, the way the streets are organized these days. Uh, they moved off the farm after he got out of the Navy, but they, they were hearing preaching in the Christian church there uh, that they did they thought was pretty liberal, despite uh, because there were people in the church that wanted them to go with the disciples, and Trinkle was fighting this battle to keep them from doing that. Um, so you get this, this perpetual leftward kind of drift. And my grandparents and my dad, who was a teenager by the 1930s, ultimately left this church that he was the financial secretary for after H. Uh, Leo Bowles came to Englewood Christian Church. They had actually moved to Englewood by that time and gave this famous speech in 1939, which lasted, what, two and a half hours, I think, in which he just lambasted the instrument and explain why Churches of Christ would never use instrumental music and why he felt it was unbiblical and so forth. And my grandparents and my dad and my aunt uh, Ruthanna uh, left the Christian church at that time and wound up, they, they lived closer than the east side, which became Irvington. They lived closer to 40th and Capitol. So they moved there and attended there until after World War II. Uh, a young preacher by the name of Robert Turner was preaching there. Uh, he was graduating from the University of and came over and preached for them. He told me once that my granddad was the second person to respond to the invitation into his preaching and renounced instrumental music and the Christian church and all of that kind of stuff. So if you look at the other direction that East 91 has gone, uh, E91 is pretty prominent, not only in the North American Christian Convention, but even among the megachurch movement. Uh, now this information is several years old. I didn't go back and refresh it, but uh, it was number six in Outreach Magazine's top 25 evangelistic mega churches. Anybody ever been up there? Uh, I used to visit some of the megas in, uh, especially the Christian church in Louisville and, and Lexington when I lived there. It's an interesting experience. You might want to do that if you haven't had the opportunity. But they had, at that point, about 4,000 in attendance, 50 people on their paid staff, two concurrent services of about 1,000 in attendance each, one contemporary one traditional because they're fighting that same worship wars kind of thing. And they try to evangelistically start one church outside the state of Indiana every year. So they retain this kind of conservative Christian church focus despite all the denominational trappings. I mean, these guys in the North American Christian Convention will still talk about generally one true church. They'll talk about the need for baptism. Uh, they'll be very much anti-modernism, anti-postmodernism. Uh, when I lived in Danville, the guy that became one of my best friends was the preacher for this conservative Christian church. Uh, 
uh, and both of us were just reviled by the guy who was, uh, and, and women later became preachers at the Disciple Congregation because of our public stance and writing the paper and all kinds of other things. But there, they, we share a lot in common on some level with some of these more conservative Christian church uh, preachers. Um, so anyway, that's that's a list off their website of all of their different kind of ministries. So from a little clapboard church in 1932 to E91, just a couple of generations later, that's a very different group. Even though they retain some degree of conservatism, that's a whole different focus. The old church there. Um, I'm not sure why that's there. <laughs> my, my parents and grandparents, uh, after the war, went to uh, Irvington. Uh, they would, had gone to high school with Earl West, who's a picture you see there. Same guy that wrote Search for the Ancient Order. Earl performed the wedding ceremony for my mom and dad, so they, they began attending there. My grandfather was an elder, my dad was a deacon. And it says there, little, little Jimmy showed up, and he was a mighty good baby. I think that, there you have it, Mike. That <laughs> recorded for posterity. Uh, so, uh, I think we've covered all that so far. I, I'm not, I'm not going to make a prediction here. Uh, why is this? Get back to the last slide. Uh, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but do the math. And I'm not predicting that we are going to divide within the next year or maybe even the next decade, but I'll tell you, brothers, we are headed into the teeth of the storm. Those of us who live long enough to see it are going to be maybe surprised and shocked at how nasty, short, and brutish it is. Over and over again. That's, the, that's true about every division. People don't see it coming. They want to deny that it's going to happen. They can't. They don't read the sign. They're not good at looking at the tea leaves. Even those of us that kind of read a little bit of history, we don't want to believe it about some of our brothers, but, but it's coming, I fear, if the Lord does not. Well, I said I'd define restoration movement. I mean by restoration movement, and we're coming up on 11, so I'll come up for air here in a minute. Movement to unite Christians by abandoning denominationalism and restoring New Testament Christianity. That's what this movement was about. That's what the Campbells and Scott and Stone and those guys, in the, they, they were saying, we can abandon these denominational groups. I mean, you look at the trek of the Campbells, for example. Thomas Campbell's grandfather was a Roman Catholic. And his son, Thomas's father, left Roman Catholicism to become an Anglican, a member of the English Catholic Church. And then Thomas becomes a member of the Old Light anti burger Seceder Presbyterian Church, which tells you that the Presbyterians are divided 18 ways from Sunday. Sometimes people say, well, the Restoration Movement is a divisive movement. It just divides churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does like every other denomination, and I get students sometimes that think, well, that's the, the, it's something that just the restoration movement does and nobody else divides, and I'm like, what planet are you on? I mean, every religious group divides over these same kinds of issues that seem minor and trivial to people who are not involved in the division and don't maybe understand what actually is occurring. So when we talk about New Testament Christianity or restoration principles, I mean the emphasis of divine authority over human opinions, the emphasis on scripture as opposed to human creeds, the emphasis on revelation rather than what my family did or family traditions, an emphasis on the use of the word Christian to describe what we are as opposed to human labels of Baptist or Lutheran or Campbellite or whatever, New Testament Christianity versus denominationalism. That's what I mean, and it's striking to me that some of our young guys who are so intent on seeing denominationalism or sectarianism among churches of Christ, and I understand that we, we, it's possible for us to become sectarian in our thinking, but I've seen two examples of this recently where guys have left what they call the sectarianism of churches of Christ, and guess what they did? They joined a denomination. One of them's on YouTube in the Baptist Church baptistry, reading, talking about the sectarianism of the Church of Christ and how the bad, the, the evils of denominationalism. And he's going to be baptized into the the Southern Baptist Congregation. Another young man flew the coop, and he's now a preacher in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, as denominational and creedal as you could possibly get. And yet they think we're sectarian. 
Well, yeah, we need to fight sectarianism and denominational mentality among us. That's not already a communication of denomination. That's what I'm talking about. Well, you can uh, read more about this in the, the, some of you probably have the, that's a really good doorstop if you want to read it. But it occurred to me as I look back over what they asked me to write for this encyclopedia, that all of these guys are dissenters too. Just like Alexander Campbell then leaves the old light anti burger seceder Presbyterian Church and joins the Redstone Baptist Association and then the Mahoning Association after Redstone gets ready to kick him out and they say, you can't fire me, I quit. And then leaves the Baptist Association uh, to say, we just want to be Christians. Well, all of these guys that I've actually kind of spent my, my historical career uh, studying and writing about, all of them were dissenters. That is, every last single one of them left the church or the group they were raised in or had been a part of or had become notable preachers in and said, some of what you're doing is wrong and we need to stop it, or if we can't stop it, then I'm going to leave. That's the common thread that runs through each one of these and even, even some of the institutions, as a matter of fact. Well, okay. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I don't know that they're okay. They might be. I just, I haven't looked at them real recently. And my sense is that they would, um, even if they would emphasize baptism in a doctrinal sense on a doctrinal statement, I don't know that they push it very much. In fact, just to give you an example, I have a friend who's big in that movement, teaches at one of their colleges. And I asked him, actually, at the North American Christian Convention meeting when it was at Southeast in Louisville, big mega church, but probably even bigger than E91. And I said, tell me this. If somebody's baptized here at Southeast Christian or East 91st Street, and they move somewhere like Minneapolis, let's say, or the Bay Area of California, where there is no Christian church, mega church, the only Christian church, North American Christian Convention church you'd find in Minneapolis would be a little bitty clapboard church of 75 people because there are not many members of that religious group up there. So my question is, where would they go? Would they go to that little bitty North American Christian Convention congregation? Or would they find a Lutheran megachurch to go to? I guess if the, I don't know if the Lutherans have megachurches or not, but would, they'd find a megachurch of some other denomination to go to. And without... Blinken and I, he said, they go to the megachurch. I mean, they're converted to the big megachurch, the multiple ministries, and what they emphasize doctrinally really does not matter. So even though, I and I don't want to say that East 91st would not be conservative, but that's not their calling card. That's not what they're selling. It's not what they push. So, yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, Mike. I don't know that for a fact, but I suspect that's probably right. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure you would find uh, many of the North American Christian Convention churches that would do that, but some of the megas very well might. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind is most of the North American Christian Convention congregations are these small rural or small town churches scattered all over Indiana and Illinois and Kansas and Kentucky and wherever, and they would tend to be much more conservative than the large mega churches in the urban areas. So you do get, that goes back to this kind of social and economic forces that, that play into how these divisions work out. But anyway, well, I, uh, I got a call from one of these Christian church preachers about 1986, a man by the name of Alan Cloyd, whose parents were in Louisville. And uh, Alan was converted, was, was a member of the Christian church. I mean, his parents were, they were in Christian church. He went to Joplin to the college there, was sort of a rising megastar in their uh, organization, uh, and then got involved in the uh, Marvin Bryant ministries. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember Marvin Bryant? Marvin Bryant was an ex-Presbyterian preacher. He was certified and seminary educated and licensed and ordained and all of that stuff and then learned the truth and left that and became a gospel preacher. Uh, 
uh, working among uh, institutional churches in the 1970s. And he hit on the idea of, of uh, going into a city and with the institutional churches organizing a banquet in which they would invite uh, all the denominational preachers they could reach to come and they would give them a nice meal and present the gospel as they understood it in a very positive, non-negative uh, no sharp edges kind of thing, and they were successful in reaching some denominational people. Alan Cloyd was one of them. And Alan dropped by my office at Expressway one day in 1976 and said, can we talk? He knew that his parents, who were uncomfortable with some of the ways their Christian church was going, uh, was uh, they would occasionally come over to Expressway on Sunday night and hear me preach. Loved my preaching, so they said just really good preaching. Liked it until... One night I preached on the Masonic Lodge. <laughs> and I, I honestly, I did nothing but put up statements on the overhead from Masonic literature, from what the Masons themselves said. He got as mad as a hornet and left, and they never came back. But Al, I'd kind of gotten to know Alan, and so he said, look, we've been having these Joplin-style unity meetings occurred in the early 70s. We'd like to reach out and talk to the people on our right wing. So can we organize something uh, with the non-institutional churches? So that was how the Nashville meeting got started. And some of you were there. I know Mike spoke. I think I put up a list of uh, some of the participants. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, we did the Nashville meeting. I've gotten ahead of my slides here. But uh, yeah, one kind of gives the sort of how this breaks out with regard to the, push the wrong button here, John. Um, you get on the, the left wing, Christian church, the disciples, you go through their 1968 restructure and are headquartered here in Indianapolis. Most of their agencies are here. Um, although even their, their oldest seminary, Lexington Theological Seminary, has sold their campus sold off their library. They are now a totally online institution that operates out of a small suite of offices in the office complex in Lexington. So campus can be closed uh, right across the street from the, from the law school. And I think the law school will probably be taken over. But Lexington Theological, Theological Seminary does not exist anymore except as an online school. They have sold off the building of the Disciples Historical Society in Nashville. And I did a lot of work in research and study the archives and one of the, the best collection and physical plant of any denominational historical society in the country, period, bar none. They have gotten so small and are bleeding so many members and so much money, they have sold it off, moved it to Bethany where it's in a barn, a steel frame barn next to the Campbell Mansion. So this denomination continues its bleed, continues its decline independent Christian churches, the North American Christian Convention, their, their actual official legal name is the Undenominational Fellowship of Christian Churches and Churches of Christ, Inc. They're an incorporated body. And you know if you visit around in the Midwest, you can find churches in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, that you drive into town. I, uh, my dad, when we were about 10 years old, took us uh, on a vacation. We stopped in Farmington, Missouri reason it's emblazoned on my mind is one of the most embarrassing incidents of my youth, but it taught me an important lesson. We found a building there. We're there on a Saturday, and Dad went and found a building that said Church of Christ. We walked in Sunday morning. People were sitting down. He spied the organ up in the corner, and man, we did a 180. I mean, we were almost down to the front, so here we go out the door, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but it taught me an important lesson that if you believe something, better stand for it even if it causes you embarrassment or even if it's not pleasant to, uh, to do that. But anyway, these, these conservative Christian churches um, still exist and many of them are conservative. Now, a lot of their historians have talked about this underlying change in the mentality. This is W.E. Garrison, uh, whose father uh, was the editor of the Christian Evangelist, very important figure in the split of the disciples. His son, W.E., became much more liberal. He was educated at the University of Chicago, did a lot of books. In fact, he and A.T. DeGroote wrote the first history of the disciples. And this book, Heritage and Destiny, an American Religious Movement Looks Ahead, he's reflecting about as we move forward, what does our past look like? And 
says differences in attitude toward the Bible underlie almost all the points that are at issue between thoroughgoing conservatives and liberals of whatever degree of liberalism. It doesn't matter what your degree of liberalism is, you've got a different view of the Bible. And that plays out in, uh, in this book. This is a guy who's a partner in the writing of that history, A.T. DeGroote, wrote a book in which he called the book Church of Christ Number Two. You know what Church of Christ Number Two is? Mike says, yeah, this North American Christian Convention. To him, from his perspective, the disciples, they're just the Church of Christ reincarnated, if you will. Now, of course, we know as members of Church of Christ that there's a world of difference between us and between the North American Christian Convention. But looking at it from the disciples' standpoint, they're Church of Christ number two because they still retain some degree of conservatism in the demand for Bible authority, like your question is pointing out. They would probably still technically insist on baptism. It is hard to know, Garrison says, how early it began to be evident that there were two types of mind, even among those disciples who agreed that missionary society and organs were not necessarily offenses against the restoration principle. That is, against those who felt like you could use an organ, use a missionary society, this difference in mindset begins to be apparent so that by the end of the 19th century, some began to accept the newer view of the Bible, which was beginning to win some away from the traditional view of authorship and dates and biblical books, and to destroy the ancient delusion that belief in plenary inspiration and biblical infallibility was an essential article of the Christian faith. That's now no longer not necessary. It is labeled a delusion to believe that. The infiltration of a different view of the Bible had already begun, however. It manifested itself, look at this, in an increasing tolerance for it, even by those who did not openly accept it. They didn't even tolerate it. To a tendency away from the authoritarian type of preaching, which buttressed every proposition with the citation of a proof book. You want to make a point? You better have book, chapter, and verse to bolster it. That's the second point. And third, by a friendlier attitude toward other denominations. Now, if that doesn't get replayed 60 years later in the institutional, non institutional controversy, I, I, I can't think of a better way to describe it. Increasing tolerance for things that would be in opposition to the Bible, a tendency away from authoritarian type of preaching, and a friendlier attitude toward other denominations. So that's what that produces. Now, what I would say is that you've got the main point I want to make in this segment of what we're talking about is you got the same thing in the institutional tradition. Yes, originally there were just two groups, antis and liberals, non-institutional and institutional. But what's happened over the next couple of generations is you get this middle group that likes to think of itself as moderate. We're talking about the gospel advocate movement here. The liberals would be Pepperdine, the church is kind of in that orbit, Abilene Christian, David Lipscomb University, probably um, <coughs> Fried Hardeman and Faulkner might hold. We talked to the people at Harding and they are scared to death where their student body's headed. They'll tell you that their faculty is pretty secure and solid on instrumental music. Their students come from all these churches where that's just not an issue. And a lot of them are adopting things that <clears throat> either use instruments or shortly will. So you get the same kind of, is there a pointer on this? No, it doesn't look like it. Anyway, you, you can get your, you can get the layout, it's all right so that you get institutional, liberal, progressive, whatever you want to call it, and then you get non-institutional, conservatives, antis, thank you, and then you get this group. Now, what's interesting here, the point is, what started as a large group of 85% of the churches in 1960, let's say, maybe 10, 15%, 1960 or 65, has now in some ways equalized I asked Greg in this meeting in Nashville, what percentage of these, the mainstream churches, with all of these together, what percentage of them would be, be in this group that would accept instrumental music or say it doesn't matter, they might not promote it, but they don't think it's a deal. 
that have been a big deal uh, and would accept women preachers and so forth. Anybody want to guess what the percentages are? Not quite that bad, but when I asked him about that, he, without batting an eye, said 30% 30, 30 or a third of the churches and half their members. Half their members would not oppose women preachers or the use of an instrument in a third of the churches. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, I think there's, just as with the, the uh, division in the 20s and so forth, that mid or, uh, middle or moderate group, I think that's probably right, Mike. The problem is measuring it is is difficult. I mean, Greg says we, we can't even get accurate numbers to tell you exactly what the percentages are because there are so many people who are leaving these liberal progressive churches and going leaving churches of Christ altogether. I mean, they're identifying with the evangelical free church or E91 or whatever the, the local mega church happens to be. So it's really not possible today to get a really accurate count of who's in the institutional churches of Christ on the left wing and who's leaving. And I'm sure you're right that there is some bleed off here out of some conservative churches into this quote unquote moderate mainstream. I don't have any doubt about that. Um, but let me let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about, and then uh, I can, uh, there's my list of who was at the national meeting. A lot of these guys are no longer with us. As opposed to the Arlington meeting, I don't think any of these guys, with the possible exception of Jimmy Allen, still alive. Jim Campbell still alive. So I don't know. Those of these guys, that my point is, that's a different generation. These fellows who were who were staunch advocates of their views at the time this was occurring, they're not with us anymore. It won't be long before even that second generation, my generation, that has a memory of it happening but didn't actively participate in it, we're not going to be around anymore. And when that happens, uh, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Now, when I taught American religious history at the University of Kentucky, uh, I use the standard textbook. This is, you'll find this book in any college bookstore you walk into, probably in the U.S. of A. It's a standard text on religious history, and I think it charts in a broader sense what's happened among institutional churches. As denominations have modernized their doctrines and embraced temporal values, they have gone into decline. That is a cliche in American religious history. The message becomes more worldly, it is held with less certainty as religion becomes the focus of scholarly critique and attention. Decline starts when they begin to lift restrictions on behavior and to soften doctrines that have served to set the group apart in social environments, to make them different from the world. When that starts to soften and we get behavioral changes, that's when this sort of thing happens. As the general affluence and social standing of a group rises, other worldliness as expressed through tension with the environment. That is to say, here's a group that says, we're not of this world, we're different from this world, we want to go to heaven. Our emphasis is not on saving the Florida alligator or necessarily putting up a soup kitchen. That's not what our emphasis is. It becomes perceived as increasingly costly. Religious organizations are stronger to the degree that they impose significant costs in terms of sacrifice and even stigma on their members who demand that you get up and walk out of a building if they start to do something that you don't agree with or that you think is unscriptural or any of these things and demand that you now spend more time learning how to lead singing, building a, a new congregation that you have to go to, whatever that is. Uh, that's just a staple of American religious history. Um, I occasionally get people who don't like the use of the term worldliness. So I found this definition of it by uh, Robert Gundry, who's an evangelical credentials are impeccable. He says, by worldliness, I mean, and I agree with his list here, although I'd expand it, not merely the disregard of fundamentalist views, but the views against smoking, drinking, dancing, movie going, gambling, and the like. My granddad wrote a tract in 1949, I think, called um, the, the Holy Committed Life. 
fully surrendered life back to Jesus. Right? You know what he talks about? He talks about smoking. He, he quit smoking before I was born. And I can tell you, sitting around the dinner table, years after he'd still, after supper, he had his coffee. He tried to get other people to quit, quit their drinking and their dancing and their movie going and their gambling and so forth. But Gundry says more expansively, materialism is eating the heart out of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as we live in this ever more secularizing materialistic culture, pleasure seeking, indiscriminate enjoyment of salacious and violent entertainment, immodesty of dress, voyeurism, looking at all this stuff, photography, whatever, sexual laxity and divorce. That's not my list. That's this guy who's pretty deep into the left wing of the evangelical churches. He knows what it is. It's an interesting uh, illustration. Mark Love, who preached for a while, where my brother, if you know, about the church that's in Pepperdine orbit, went to Abilene as the lectureship director, and uh, is now at Michigan Christian and Rochester College. He's talking about how we have begun to, in the institutional church, one day, begin to ape these seeker mega churches. Given the impressive results of seeker churches like Willow Creek, which is the original mega up in the Chicago area, or Saddleback, which is Rick Warren's Southern Baptist mega church out in California, the pull to mimic their direction is nearly irresistible. One need only read the classified ads of churches looking for ministers in the Christian Chronicle to see the influence of seeker models on our thinking about evangelism. So, so your question about how do they evangelize, they evangelize by doing surveys of the community, what do you want in a church, and then you give it to them. You don't preach what they need or what they may not want to hear. You find out what they want, and then you, you're popular by giving them what it is. Now, you may dress it up in, in certain ways, but that's the, that's the idea. Uh, this guy's saying that's happening among churches in Christ. Um, anybody here not familiar with the expression of concern, 1986? Well, it won't hurt us to read it again. This was a group of, I think, 250 of the conservative institutional brethren who were concerned about where they were headed. And so they wrote this expression of concern in which they said, we are deeply disturbed over the liberalism that is so evident among the brotherhood. By liberalism, we mean especially the following items. Number one, A, there is a drifting from the Bible-centered and definitive distinct doctrine once characterized our preaching. Many of our people, including preachers and elders, no longer know the difference between Christianity and the corrupted forms of it so prevalent among them. So B, there is a concerted effort on the part of some brethren to restructure the organization, worship, and work of the church along the sectarian lines. Do tell. Some of the guys that signed this expression of concern in 1986 are some of the same ones who got that ball rolling in 1956 that with all of the entertainment and the restructuring. Third, a spirit of doctrinal compromise and fellowshipping with those blatant religious error has permeated our ranks. So this is the conservative part of the institutional churches looking at the direction their left wing was starting to head in 1986, a third of a century ago, and has now completed that trek in many instances. The world has made alarming inroads into the church. Instead of the church influencing the world for righteousness, world has adversely affected many brethren in matters of morality and conduct of life. And then finally, the typical emphasis of the denominational world on recreation, entertainment, and solving the social ills of society has been incorporated into the programs of many congregations, supplanting the God-given work of meeting the spiritual needs of those both within and without the body of Christ. Uh, you, you can only read that with just a sort of a sh shake in my head. Because all of these guys, the, I mean, they started with, they're objecting in 1986 to something like the church where Ed Fudge was at the time. They had this big Houston uh, advertising push because they had a 300-foot-long hot dog at their BBS, world's largest hot dog. And some of the institutional churches thought that was just going way too far. Well, what's the difference in... 300 one foot long hot dogs at your PBS and one 300 foot long hot dog. It's just a little liberalism produces a lot more. And I, I've just threw in a bunch of these presentations that I'm going to skip through here. But this this one I think is pretty interesting. This is Wilbur Collins, uh, former um, president or vice president of Lipscomb. 
who is asked to compare as he is retiring in 19, mid 80s, the condition of churches, institutional churches in the 80s as compared to the 30s when he started preaching. He says, I don't think they see the glory of the church unencumbered with the denomination of as I did when I was growing up. I don't think the members of the church see it as different from Protestantism. And he goes on to say, when asked to do that, he said, when I started preaching, a lot of members of the church believed Protestants needed to be saved. You wouldn't find that in a lot of these institutional churches. At an earlier time, they felt the church was a lot better than Protestantism. Um, I came across this in the Restoration Quarterly, and this is what, 1987. So this is not new news. John T. Willis reviewing a denominational Methodist writer. It is consistent to believe that the Bible is authoritative in matters of faith and practice but may be incorrect in geographical or historical details. Once a person abandons the concept of divine dictation, he must abandon the idea of inerrancy. I'll tell you, I was sitting, when I read this the first time, I was sitting in the men's room at Lexington Theological Seminary. I nearly fell off what I was sitting on. <laughs> I had to go back and read it just to make sure I was reading that correctly. Um, now, as I said later, I would like to believe that this is a misprint or somehow I misunderstood the author, but it would not be the first instance of doubt being cast on the veracity of scripture by those who are freely accepted and granted the right hand of fellowship by institutional brethren. Some of you might remember, you might remember David Bobo, preacher down at Fountain Square. We used to go down there for meetings. My dad learned to lead singing down at the Fountain Square Church. Um, Bobo, as early as 1960 speaking on the Abilene Christian Lectures and casting doubt on the, the veracity and the inerrancy of Scripture and yet was received into fellowship by most of the institutional churches in Indianapolis. They received him and even Earl West would continue to have fellowship with him. But, but at Annie, no, we can't have fellowship with them. I mean, it's just it's strange bedfellows are made in these kinds of, of divisions, I guess you'd say. Yes, I So you need to get with the program, Mike. Um, well, anyway, I wanted to get up a little bit. This is uh, Abe Mallerby, no longer the chief, no longer with us. He's deceased about 2012. Um, but his credentials are impeccable. He's a South African, converted into the preaching of Eldred Eccles, comes to the States as a bachelor of the ACU, and goes on to Harvard for his PhD, taught at ACU for a few years, but then he goes to Yale where for nearly three decades he was the Buckingham Professor of New Testament Interpretation. He retired three of the finalists to replace him in that position. The person who was finally accepted were his graduate students, most of whom had also gone to ACU. So when he retired, the Christian Chronicle did an interview with him that included this question, what are some of your concerns for our fellowship? Here's what he said. My major concern is our cozying up to those evangelicals at the expense of reason. Evangelical priorities and language have come to suffuse much of the preaching in our fellowship. Now, not all evangelicals do that, but some of them do. And he says, combined with the style of preaching, which is common in all churches these days, which is narratival and anecdotal, that means tell me a story. Let me tell you about my dog. Let me tell you about my kid. Let me tell you about the concert I went to last night. That's what the preaching is composed of, rather than expository, where you take a biblical text and you explain what the text means in its context. So this preaching that's narratival and anecdotal storytelling, rather than expository, results in sermons that are as theologically thin rule as many of the so-called praise songs we sing, the 7-Eleven hymns. I, somebody accused me of coining that phrase. I wish it were true, but it is not. I stole it from the Methodist probably the guy that introduced it to Churches of Christ, but it's not original to me. It seems that the goal of many services is to achieve an emotional response without imparting biblical knowledge. Make me feel good, make me cry, give me some kind of an emotional experience, whether you teach me anything or not. 
And I'll tell you, I don't get to listen to much preaching because I'm usually preaching myself, but when I visit churches on vacation or traveling between meetings, or you sit at some of the lectureships even among us, just close your eyes and listen to to the audience noise. When is the audience in its most rapt attention so that you can hear a pin drop? Not when the scripture is being read. Not when the word of God is being expounded. Not when doctrines of religious bodies that are false religious groups are being reproved and exposed. You'll hear all kinds of audience noise. Yeah. Tell me a deathbed story. Tell me about when my daughter did this that was an emotional kind of experience or my son nearly drowned or what, whatever the story is. And it's pin drop quiet. Try that sometime. That's my experience. So um, where we've uh, where we've gone from there among the institutional churches, uh, this is uh, Rob McRae from a book called The Transforming of a Tradition. The article is titled The Last Will and Testament of the Church of Christ. Anybody familiar with Restoration History will catch the irony there because the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery was what took Martin Stone and others out of the Presbyterian Church. So he's saying we ought to do the same thing for the Church of Christ. The irony is just when churches up and down the street are reevaluating their denominational status and seeking to be more non denominational, they don't want their denominational affiliation known. Saddleback. Rick Warren's church in California is a Southern Baptist church even today, but you would not know that from the advertising. A lot of these megas that are associated with the uh, Church of God in Christ or the Assemblies of God, if you read their literature in the fine print, you'll find out that, yeah, they're still denominationally affiliated and a certain percentage of their contributions go to headquarters in Springfield or Memphis or wherever the denominational headquarters is, but they're not going to let that be known. They're a community church. So they're trying to be more non-denominational while that's going on. Many among us are abandoning the goal of non-denominational Christianity and seeking to be more like the other denominational churches. That we have become what we once despised is undeniable. That is absolutely true among institutional churches. And I'm seeing signs that are pretty disturbing to me that that's not limited to not to institutional churches. I think there's some, uh, some brand of that that uh, is afflicting conservative churches. Now I'll close with this. This is actually from a lecture I did on the Truth Lakes a few years ago, but if you look at the kind of preaching that's done, uh, increasingly leading preachers turn to language, props, and forms of television shows, narrating sermons, and obituary uses as history of reviving ancient faith. Popular television game show formats. Let that sit with you for a minute. Popular television game show formats provide the form for the sermon content. Preachers become characters from popular religious television sitcoms along with featured replica props. Again, to narrate ideas or create a dialogue with the congregation to convey the ideas of the sermon. No expository preaching. Let's just tell a story or put a game show or something like that up. Preaching in rural and urban grace-oriented churches of Christ and in some large suburban congregations has transformed its focus from what Alexander Campbell called the gospel fact to a user-friendly gospel. Actually, that's from Mike Casey's article. I don't know if he was with the Encyclopedia of Women's Going Camp up here. But in another article, given the impressive, oh, well, you did that. Um, there's a section, I think this is actually from Hughes' book. It may be from Casey. I'm going the wrong way here. The right button. Max Lucado adapted the narrative capabilities of his mentor, Lynn Anderson, who's a longtime Herald of Truth speaker, and he just took it a few steps farther than that, noting that this narrative or storytelling is the primary technique in Cato's preaching. Mike Casey, Mike was, and he's now deceased, and and I became friends because of our shared interest in history, fought at Pepperdine for a long time. But Mike reported that occasionally he has simply told a story for the entire sermon. This is in Mike's book on preaching on the churches of Christ. Lucado once moved the pulpit out of the way and sat in a big chair and narrated a fable that was before. That's the sermon. 
makes he notes that the postmodern style of preaching is increasingly prevalent in both churches of Christ and in the wider evangelical world. You're probably familiar with the uh, spin that was made a few years ago by this young lady who had graduated from Lipscomb and became uh, the preacher or a preacher at the Fourth Avenue Church in Franklin, Tennessee. My wife's grandfather was an elder in that church as late as 1950. I'm sure he would be rolling over in his grave if he were able to know where that church has gone. Pepperdine recently appointed, appointed a university chaplain, a woman for the first time. And I have a theory about what you're about to see next. How do you make somebody like this young, very attractive young preacher more palatable in churches that may not be openly receptive to that to fully. Well, what you feed them on the same lectureship that you announce the appointment of your woman chaplain is you feed them Nadia Bowles Weber, who's the keynote speaker for one of the sessions of that lectureship, a tattooed lesbian Lutheran preacher who is described by the Washington Post. Now, this is not my description. This is the Washington Post description as a, a, her liberal, foul-mouthed articulation of Christianity described or includes beer and hymns. That's their Sunday night service at this Lutheran church that she preached in Denver. Well, hey, Martin Luther did beer and hymns, so it must be good, good enough for Luther. We should sure have good for any Lutheran church, right? Uh, but, but compared to that, Maybe this doesn't look quite so bad. I don't know. It's a theory. At any rate, this is happening. Uh, and I came across this quotation from Lipscomb. Actually, it was written in one of my father-in-law's books. And I asked him once where he found it. He couldn't remember. And uh, my attitude is the person who didn't say he should have. Apostasies come and will come. When they come, they come in the midst of an untaught, ease-loving, self-serving generation. If that doesn't describe 21st century America, I don't know what does. But the churches sometimes that occupy that. Somebody sent me a quotation saying, well, this is the original quote. I've asked people all over the country where, where you find his list of quote on. So in the Franklin Road News and Views, but this is 1961. This is not the original article, and it's attributed to something in the 1930s. Well, this was died in 1970. I don't know whether this is the original or not, but this version has that apostasies come and will come. They come where the cause is popular, where an ease-loving and popularity-seeking spirit prevails and always manifests themselves among those who avoid controversy and discussion. The suppressed discussion is the deprived truth of all that is vanity. That has been attributed to the 30s or the person who's been dead for 13 years by that time. So that, that's not the original. But like I say, if he didn't say it, he should have. Well... That's probably enough. Um, these brethren in the gospel advocate camp are scared to death of that kind of stuff. They see where their churches are going. They see people bolting churches of Christ for the denominational world. They see shrinking numbers among churches of Christ. And some of them are frightened enough, I think, and open enough to be able to reach out even to the dreaded aunties to see if there's anything that we might be able to do together. Actually, there are a few more I need to show. Art Adams is with us here. They asked me, they asked me at Columbus to talk a little bit about what can we do together? Uh, what might we be able to work together in terms of those in institutional churches and those in non-institutional churches? And my answer, as you can tell, included a whole string of things that we do as individuals. Like, for example, sacred selection for Symphonia or Leaving the Fifth Art or Florida College or Truth Publications, my kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that any churches do. Uh, examples, institutions. I mean, I don't have a problem with human institutions. Do you? My issue is, is the church supposed to be the funding agency for these human institutions? Or is it possible for us to join together in a kind of cooperation as individuals that does not involve uh, any church uh, either usurping its work or any church doing the work that it's not supposed to do? So some of the examples that I gave were sacred selections, 
which actually hits our institutional brethren right square between the eyes because it is the best answer I know to the argument, we like what we're doing better than what you're not doing. Here is a way for orphans, I think Sacred Selection is what up to now, 200 orphans that have been placed in homes of people. Um, David Karatsa told me that uh, the West, is it West Lake, it's happened on 465 Institutional Church, sent them a fairly large check, it's I think $15,000 or something, because they like the work that Sacred Selection is doing. Sacred Selection sent it back and said, we do not accept funds from churches. Now, if you have individuals there who might be able to give us money, we would be happy to accept that. And I think eventually they got nearly that amount by individuals there sending it. The point is, this is something that we can do together as individuals, uh, as well as Symphonia, which is a separate organization which has produced at least one hymnal and hopes to produce other materials for study and so forth. Uh, recently, uh, the video that was made appeared in the Christian Chronicle in their Voices Only uh, website. Uh, that's the class that meets every year at the University of Missouri, Leaving the Pit. I told them a little bit about that art, which is an attempt to uh, pull together, and I'll put your schedule up there. This is back in January. Uh, an attempt to pull together uh, trained professionals from a wide array of disciplines to be a resource for individuals who have mental health issues from pornography to depression to whatever it might happen to be. I'm sure Art can tell you more about that, so I borrowed some of your slides, Art, and tried to tell them a little bit about leaving the pit. Uh, Florida College is an individually supported educational institution which teaches the Bible in some classes anyway, but also provides, uh, I think, sound educational experience in a lot of different disciplines. It is entirely individually supported, so if somebody wants to know what can we work together on here are some examples of what we might be able to do. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Florida College camps, and then Mike, I told them about Truth Magazine. I saved it till last, so <laughs> they wouldn't kick me out uh, before I got to all the other stuff. But uh, I mean, Truth Magazine, like the Gospel Advocate. I mean, I asked Greg, does the Gospel Advocate take church support? He said, absolutely not. It's an individually supported way of teaching the gospel. As far as I know, the advocate has never accepted church contributions. I can't say maybe what they were doing back in the 1870s, but they, they certainly in this gen modern generation, they don't accept church contributions. So why can we not work together in areas that we agree with some of our institutional brethren that does not involve church cooperation or the support of human institutions? Now, I know different people may have different views about that and some people might be willing to go farther than I'm willing to go or not as far as I'm willing to go. Uh, but I think anything that we can do to promote uh, the ability to teach and to explain what it is that the Bible says about what is the work of the church as opposed to what is the work of individuals, that, that's such a critical point to me that, that I'm willing to suggest that there might be some of these things that we can do together in a number of other ways. So. I think that's all I've got here. So I'm going to shut up, John, unless somebody has questions. It's almost 11.45, which is lunchtime, I'm told. You've got six minutes, Steve Niemeyer. I, I get asked that all the time, and I, if, if you put a gun to my head and force me to say what are some of the issues, I would say probably instrumental music and women preachers. I think we are going to get to a point. Now, there may be other things, and there's a lot that supports that or that's bubbling beneath the surface, but I think we live in a culture in which saying women can't preach is such a, a cultural no-no, and instrumental music is so popular, um, you know, the, the question of if it's so scriptural to not use an instrument, then why don't most people see that? So if you put a gun to my head and say, you know, pick the issues, I'd say those. And what, I'll turn it back to you. What would you say? Well, yes, I think that's good. the cultural pressure to do that, uh, I think, is huge. And I, 
you know, my answer to that issue, though, is, uh, you know, if they force us to start using the church at Downers Grove for homosexual weddings, it's our policies. We don't use the building for weddings, period. So they can't accuse us of discrimination. They could make me preach the service. They wouldn't like what I said. <laughs> so you probably be best not even ask me. John. I think you have to sit down and do a lot of talking. Part of the problem is we just don't communicate to each other. We don't talk. I mean, I've reflected on why did Alan Cloyd pick me to talk about what became the Nashville meeting? Well, maybe because I'm the only Andy he actually knew. Um, when I was teaching overseas at, in Vienna at the International Christian University in the late 80s, I taught there in the fall semester of 89, I guess, as the wall was coming down. Um, and I, I taught, I told him American history, and I said, I will come and do this. I will not charge you a thing because I don't want to have any financial fellowship with you because I don't agree with your taking church support to, to teach your Bible courses. But what I will do is I'll insist that you give me a couple of sessions to sit down and talk with you about. And it became pretty clear. I mean, I was talking to the president and the dean and so forth and some of the faculty. I'm the only real life Andy they've ever met. So I think you've got to start with talking out. What would your reservations be, honestly, about being able to worship with them? What would their reservations be? Why are they disturbed about what's going on in the congregation they're thinking of leaving? I know of one church in Texas where the preacher uh, asked me, we were in the, actually at the hymn writer seminar at the University of Missouri, and, and, uh, and he, he asked me at, the, at a break one day, we're building a new building in this small town in Texas. There is a non-institutional church there you think it would be possible if we in this new building did not put a kitchen in the building would they agree to merge and I said well you know I, I can't speak for anybody else but that's certainly worth a conversation or two or three so I think it has to start with talking and you know you may eventually get to the point that it, you know, nothing's gonna happen I mean I'm pretty pessimistic about anything that can come out and my main question in October at this Lab is going to be what, how far are you guys willing to go? Because when I go to these lectureships at Faulkner or Harding and they talk all this conservative talk about how concerned they are, I walk out of the classroom into the where all the exhibits are and what do I see? I see orphanages, I see all these parachurch organizations all with their hands still out begging churches for contributions. I, I don't see them giving that up. And I certainly don't see them being able to turn the clock back, which means we're back to 1957. We've got all these institutions that some of us have conscience, scruples against uh, supporting or making a part of the work of the church. And, and I don't think they're going to give those up. So if that's the sticking point or they've just got to have the kitchen, I mean, I, I, you know, I've told these, I don't, if somebody wants to eat a donut in the building or somebody, the preacher brings his lunch or, you know, brings in a thermos of coffee, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, they used to do dinner on the ground for crying out but it becomes a deal after a while where we've got to have a donut ministry or we've got to put some special part of the building that's a coffee bar or whatever. And now it becomes something that's a, a built-in programmatic kind of feature of the church. I have a problem with that. And I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the question, yeah, I think you're right. So the question, John, would be what? Is there a possibility of practically boots on the ground at a local level being able to get together? I suspect in some places that might be possible. Um, in other places, it's just not going to happen because they're either too wed to their institutions or, you know, there's an old saying that there are few divisions that deaths and transfers don't cure. <laughs> in some places, that hadn't happened yet. Mike?
Yeah. We're going to drive them away. I just preached on that yesterday morning, and I, you know, I made the observation: we as much as I despise the the LBGTQ whatever the alphabet soup is agenda, and there is a powerful agenda trying to take over aspects of our culture. In conservative churches, we are not broken out and eaten up with homosexual people. There may be some there; I don't doubt it. Uh, but what's killing us is heterosexual immorality. People having affairs. I mean, I, just this spring, I've heard of all kinds of things of, you know, where Satan has hit the jackpot in three, four, five, six different congregations because you've got couples there that started out married to other people, one to a deacon and one's an elder's daughter, and they have an affair. And now you've got 10 children that are two families that are wrecked, and elders resigning and deacons resigning. And now you've got a church of 120 people that has no leadership. Because two people couldn't control themselves. I mean, that's what's killing us, not homosexuality. As much as we need to preach militantly about what the Bible says about homosexuality, that's not what the big problem is, in my view, among churches of Christ. Mark, you got a hand, and then I'll come back to Steve here. Okay. Exactly. Yes, it is. And and as I said, I have no doubt that there are people in church that are just probably not as open or out as the heterosexual immoralities that are occurring. But to Mike's point, the same, what will walk one thing through the door will walk the other one as well. Same common attitude. The, When I started preaching in 1969, I used as an illustration on marriage and divorce issues, what if you, what if it were a homosexual marriage? Which will never happen, of course. <laughs> but would that make it clear? Well, of course, how dumb am I? Uh, but yes, our culture has shifted under our feet. And I think the time will come, Steve, back to your point, that that will, 
very likely become a point of cultural contact. And once we get there, then who knows how many other issues are going to, once you get that camel's nose under the tent, there's a lot of camel behind that. Well, it's past lunchtime for somebody. It's 1051. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk as much as you want. Brace Rutledge. exactly right. And I make that point that churches get the kind of preaching that they demand. Or if they don't demand it, they're going to get the kind of preaching that they deserve in, in one sense of looking at that. If you don't demand biblical preaching, you're going to find something that's not that and will tickle your ear. So I think that's a, a very good observation. Steve Niemeyer. It's true, yeah, it's absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, we're headed into the teeth of the storm here. That's all I'm going to say. Well, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate being able to come and meet with you. Good questions. And John, appreciate you being the landlord here. He even, he even stayed awake for most of it. <laughs> all right. So, well, that's all I know to tell you, gentlemen. So uh, uh, let's go to lunch. Yeah, I, I could I could do that. I mean, the, this lecture basically is on the Kenny and Fishinger website in Columbus. They taped it, and it's uh, Hammond uh, Church is happy to do it over there. So, but yeah, I mean, okay. I don't know anybody that'll sit and listen to a YouTube for an hour and fifty-five minutes, but you never know. There are people that are gluttons for punishment up there. But yeah, I don't. I don't mind. I don't think any of them are copy. I mean, they have material that's quotation, but I think it's all legitimately fair, fair use cloth material.